Welcome back, everyone. It's been an interesting couple of days. Our internet here at our home went down on Thursday. And with the Christmas holiday and everything, they couldn't get anybody out here to fix it. There was something wrong with the line. Uh, so it's uh, now Monday afternoon, the day after Christmas, and we just got the internet back up. Uh, so it's been an interesting couple of days in our home, which relies very heavily on access to the internet, including me being able to upload videos. So we're back now, and I'm ready to dive back in. Uh, so uh, we're going to hit part five of the Path to Pearl Harbor, which is now out. If you did not see the first four parts of my reaction to this series from Extra History, there's a link in the description to take you back to episode one. Same goes for a link to the original content if you want to watch it without my commentary, which I highly recommend that you do and support Extra History for their fantastic historical content. Let's go ahead and dive in. Tokyo, November 5th, 1941, midnight. Sabato Kurusu quietly sits on his bed. Despite his caution, his wife Alice, an American who Kurusu met on assignment there, wakes. I'm going to the United States, probably, Kurusu says. When, replies Alice, morning. He explains that American Ambassador Gru has called in a favor to delay a Pan Am flight out of Hong Kong so Kurusu could make it via naval plane. He is to be a special envoy delivering a peace proposal to Roosevelt. Mm. It's cold. Alice wraps a blanket around him. So let's talk context here, right? November 5th. So this is almost a month to the day before the Pearl Harbor attack. It means it's probably within a week or two before the the Navy's going to have to be leaving to head out on their attack against Pearl Harbor. Um so uh, the plans for the attack on Pearl Harbor are well in place at this point. Uh, and again, we've talked throughout this series about the disconnect between the military leadership and the civilian leadership. And so I believe with all my heart, this guy probably had very good intentions, but he also probably recognized that as a part of the civilian government, he was really powerless to stop what was coming, if he even knew what was coming. This mission will be a dangerous one. Militarists had plotted to assassinate Prime Minister Konoye due to his peace platform, and one diplomat had already been murdered for getting too close to Gru. So they decide their son, an army engineer, will ride the train with him. That way, reporters would think that Kurusu was seeing him off on a deployment. And the next morning, the two head out together, with Japan's last hope for peace sitting in Kurusu's briefcase. Mm. Thanks so much to GiveWell for not only helping everyone find highly effective charities, but also making sure that our donation dollars go further. The appointment of Hideki Tojo as Prime Minister seemed to put Japan on an inevitable path to war. But ironically, behind the scenes, it was the peace faction that considered him the best candidate. That's interesting because I would think if I'm one of the nations like the United States... Uh, trying to negotiate and try to avert war with a nation like Japan, making a militarist like Hideki Tojo your prime minister sends a pretty clear message that you're not interested in peace. And so it's interesting to hear that the peace factions in Japan saw him as someone that was actually hopeful for them. After all, even if a diplomatic solution could be found, the new prime minister would need to be somebody with military pull. He would need to get okay. the army on board with any agreement and probably put down riots and attempted coups after the announcement of said agreement. So I guess what they're seeing here is by having a military guy in this civilian position of authority, it's the best of both worlds. So I get that. That makes sense. But that, of course, assumes that Hideki Tojo is interested in peace. And I don't get the feeling from what I know of the man that that's the case. And shockingly, it appeared they were right. Huh. Tojo himself was stunned by the appointment, and once in office, the enormity of Japan's predicament hit him. He now represented the whole country, and realized how dubious the Navy was about whether they could win a war with the U.S. So at a series of high-level meetings in November, he reopened the question of a diplomatic solution. Okay, so it's not that he's not a militarist, it's not that he's not somebody who's interested in fighting, but he's a realist. So he's recognizing that this war with the United States would not be in Japan's best interest. Makes total sense. What could be done? Are we even sure we can win a war? What will be the consequences? He even proposed revisiting the decision from the Imperial Conference of September 6th, laying out that if diplomatic efforts failed, war would be declared on America, Britain, and the Netherlands. This was unbelievable. Reversing an Imperial decision was unprecedented in Japanese history. 
So why Britain and the Netherlands? Because Britain and the Netherlands control areas in the South Pacific that Japan would need for natural resources. So if they're going to go to war, those are the people you need to go to war with. These contentious meetings lasted for up to 14 hours at a time. Several civilian leaders even suggested a war would be so devastating, it would actually be preferable for Japan to accept a time of economic hardship and humiliation hmm. rather than fight one. Though army leaders shot back quick, saying the country was already rationing and food prices spiking due to the American embargo. Better to declare war and have a small chance of victory than to accept the conditions of defeat without even fighting. But finally, Tojo and his new foreign minister, Shigenori Togo, emerged with a last-ditch effort for peace. They would make two proposals to Roosevelt, Proposal A and Proposal B. In Proposal A, Japan would agree to negotiate an end to the Sino-Japanese War, make an initial troop drawdown, and withdraw all troops from China over a 25-year period. And in Proposal B, Japan would immediately reverse its troop movements to the southern portion of Indochina, freeze military deployments in Southeast Asia, and pledge to remove all troops from Indochina once the war in China was concluded. In return, America would end its aid to nationalist China, sell Japan mm. oil, and broker trade agreements for rubber and other materials. So this makes total sense on Japan's part. It seems like especially option B, they're not giving up a whole lot, even op option A. We're not going to pull out completely for 25 years. Well, they're recognizing a lot can change in 25 years. And there's plenty of time to renegotiate that deal. Right now, we just need to deal with the immediate problem. And if the if dealing with the immediate problem means making a promise for 25 years down the road, that maybe 25 years from now, we'll be in a very different situation. That seems like a pretty advantageous deal for Japan. Of course, they had greater hopes for Proposal B, since it was more concrete, immediate, and managed right. to avoid the thorny issue of China. The plan was to give Roosevelt Proposal A, then if it was declined, present Proposal B, and if both were turned down, it would be war. The military pressed for a new deadline, a date after which diplomacy was considered to have failed. Tojo managed to haggle almost a month out of them. So on November 5th, as Kurusu boarded his train, Tojo and his ministers sat down with Emperor Hirohito for a new imperial conference. They outlined the proposals, the dire costs of the American embargo, and the proposed attack on Pearl Harbor. The emperor gave his assent. If peace was not found by December 1st, the attack would go ahead. The next day, when Nomura presented Proposal A to Secretary of State Hull, he found him unenthusiastic. That was pretty much expected. Yeah. What wasn't expected, however, was that Hull and Roosevelt would take until November 14th to formally turn it down. Ugh. So much later than anticipated, Nomura and Kurusu tried Proposal B. What they didn't know at that juncture, however, was that Hull already knew about this alternate proposal. Because over at the Magic Program, yep. its staff of military officers and code-breaking women, known as Code Girls, had already intercepted and deciphered the proposals when they were sent to Nomura via the Purple Code. There's a story right there, right? The Code Girls? That might be one worth making a video about down the road. Interesting. Uh, I talk about this all the time. The, the importance of uh, code-breaking and code-making during uh, this period in history is so important to understanding this period in history. It was huge. Uh, how often codes were being cracked and deciphered. And, uh, you know, we're all familiar, if you, if you study the Pacific War, with the famous code breaking that went on with the Battle of Midway and how that battle hinged on our ability to break Japan's code and figure out what they were up to. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is important stuff to, to understanding this time period. So not only had Hull read both proposals, but he also read the government's instructions to Nomura about how to present them, which rubbed him the wrong way. See, while the magic program was good at cracking Japanese codes, they were bad at translation. The program mm. was underfunded, understaffed, and had no native Japanese speakers. And that's important because you can you can translate words using, you know, like a dictionary of words, right? But that doesn't necessarily help you understand the culture uh, and the and the me the real meaning because a, a word can mean one thing in one language and culture and mean something very different in another language and culture. And some languages, some words are much harsher than they are in other languages. Some some cultures use certain words 
Um, I won't say any examples because they would be considered crude in my culture um, <clears throat> that are very commonplace in their culture. So, uh, yeah, having a native speaker who can not only explain the words, but also explain the intent behind those ki that kind of language, super important. And because diplomatic communications were conducted in formal Japanese, the resulting translations, while substantively accurate, appeared harsher and more demanding than the originals. Translators also inserted and removed words and phrases, making it appear like there was no room to maneuver, with basic errors like substituting the phrase, final concessions, with the more provocative ultimatum. Seriously, you put these things side by side and it is pretty glaring. So let's look at this. The present, the original, the present negotiations are our final effort and the security of the empire depends on it. Or the present negotiations are our final effort. In fact, we gambled the fate of our land on the throw of this die. Yeah. Hull was also, by this time, simply disinclined to believe anything Japan said. Its horrifying massacres in China and obvious preparations to invade Southeast Asia, confirmed again by the Purple Intercepts, meant that despite his friendship with Nomura, he considered the negotiations untrustworthy. Not to mention, Hull also disliked Kurusu, seeing him as a Nazi ally, since he'd signed the Tripartite Act on behalf of Japan. So let's acknowledge here for just a second, while not absolving Japan of responsibility, for their aggressive acts in places like China and other parts of the South Pacific, for some very obvious atrocities that go along with those aggressive acts, uh, for uh, a pretty powerfully pro-war stance in all of this. Let's not completely absolve the United States, especially the D diplomatic corps, of at least a little bit of responsibility in making this thing worse. So Hull and Roosevelt slow walked their response to Proposition B, considering it carefully as they also tracked Japanese forces moving into position outside of Hong Kong, in Indochina, and in ports across Japan. Purple intercepts and phone taps made it clear that Japan was talking peace, but preparing for war. To them, it appeared and, Japan would- And honestly, on, on the surface, if you take away all the other war they're already involved in, right? If we just isolate this to a Japan versus United States thing, there is nothing wrong as a nation with talking peace, but preparing for war. That's just the the responsible thing to do. If you feel like war is going to happen, you have to prepare for it. The problem is when the preparation for war makes the war itself inevitable, which we absolutely see happen in World War I. Was using diplomacy to stall their way to a better military position, and they were right. Secrecy around the Pearl Harbor attacks was incredibly tight. And the cat. Yeah. We've had a lot of very cool references here. We've seen Elsa from Frozen. We saw an Uno reverse card. And now we see a Lord of the Rings reference uh, to when Gandalf tells Frodo about the ring. He says, Keep it secret, keep it safe. That's what they we were see right. there. Secrecy around the Pearl Harbor attacks was incredibly tight. And the cabinet had specifically agreed to keep diplomats like Nomura and Kurusu out of the loop to make the bluff more convincing. Ensign Yoshikawa, the spy embedded in the Honolulu consulate from the episode earlier, didn't actually know either. He only knew he was supposed to pump drunk marines for information and to skin dive at night in the harbor channel wow. looking for submarine nets. Increasingly, he was told to create a grid map of the harbor and cable what ships were berthed in which sections. It was clear to intelligence groups, both in the U.S. and Britain, that Japanese forces were preparing to hit something, but what? If you've got, if you're intercepting communications from the island of Oahu to the Japanese military that include very detailed references to what specific ships are in Pearl Harbor, isn't it rather obvious that Pearl Harbor is a target? And then to know, for example, that the U.S. had very... At this time, we have very primitive radar. And we've got this radar station on the north end of the island of Oahu that very famously picks up the Japanese attack force coming in. But radar only operates a couple hours a day. And they, they were getting ready to shut down for the day. And they kind of are like, oh, yeah, it's a flight of B-17s coming in from the mainland. Well, I would think if you are aware that they're scouting out Pearl Harbor and things are going downhill, you'd be a little more vigilant. So this is all of this is to say this is why people have the conspiracy theories uh, that have some 
you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, and there's definitely some smoke here uh, that make it look quite plausible that Theodore Roosevelt knew the Japanese were going to attack the United States and that this was something he allowed to happen in order for us to get into a war that he very much wanted to get involved in. I'm not willing to go that far, but I can see why people think that. Singapore? The Philippines? The Dutch East Indies, maybe? Perhaps some combination. That last one seemed the most likely. And for months, British and Dutch diplomats had begged Roosevelt for even a verbal agreement that the three powers would fight together should they be attacked. But still, Hull and Roosevelt remained evasive. An agreement was premature. They were still negotiating with Japan. However, they did send out an alert to U.S. forces in the Philippines, Midway, Wake, and Hawaii that a conflict might be coming. However, this warning was so vague that individual commanders interpreted it in wildly different ways. In the Philippines, it was seen as a caution that ships might strike Singapore, in which case America may need to provide air support. While at Pearl Harbor, it was seen as a warning of possible sabotage by the local Japanese-American population. Which leads to a disastrous decision that I'm sure he's going to talk about. An air commander responded by grouping planes close together on the runway where they were easier to guard and easier to bomb. But no one in the Roosevelt administration, apart from a few outliers, truly considered Pearl a target for a Japanese strike. To do it, the Imperial Japanese Navy would have to sail far north into freezing waters before turning down into the mid-Pacific tropics. They'd risk exposure if they were spotted by even a single merchant ship, aircraft, or PBY Catalina patrols out of Midway. And a surprise carrier-based air raid at such long range had never been done before. We assumed they had good sense. So, there's another debate that goes on here, right? Um, the idea of how much did these navies understand the importance of carrier warfare and carrier-based planes and things like that? Uh, or was the mindset still that battleships are what mattered the most? Um, and, you know, there's argument about, you know, that being a, a part of why people didn't think the Japanese could do this because they didn't really think that highly of carrier-based operations yet. Uh, there's also the argument about whether or not the Japanese were really after the aircraft carriers at Pearl or whether they were after the battleships as their main target because the carriers were out of port at the time and weren't present when the attack happens, things like that. Said one American commander after the war, another admitted in racist terms that they simply didn't think the Japanese had the capability. Given the fleet movements, Roosevelt scrapped his more conciliatory counterproposal. And instead, he and Hull drew up a list of 10 hardball points, known as the Hull Note, including a full Japanese troop withdrawal from China and Indochina, abandonment of the Tripartite Pact, and to cease supporting puppet governments in China. Then, Japan could return to most favored nation status, and both countries would leave China. And they delivered that to Nomura, November 26th. On December 2nd, an undetected fleet under Admiral Nagumo, already a third of its way to Hawaii, received a coded message from Yamamoto. Climb Mount Nidaka. The code the diplomacy had failed and that the attack would begin. And All right, so it looks like we've got another episode yet. We're going to talk about Pearl Harbor itself, so... Uh, let me know your thoughts about all that. Let's continue this conversation. Love learning together. Excited to do that. Now that I've got internet again, we'll get back to daily content, daily uh, shorts about uh, specific things. And I've got some really interesting stuff that I want to talk about in some of those shorts coming up. So excited to do that. Let me know your thoughts. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.